Well, I mean, how fitting is that that uh, to kick off our robotics panel, we've got a great video that featured industrial robotics. I don't know about you guys, but I find it mesmerizing to watch. Um, so welcome everyone once again to the breakout session focused on industrial robotics and the impact they have had and can have on manufacturing. We're lucky enough to have uh, two representatives of two companies who have two different perspectives on robotics. First will be Nicholas Sustrand, General Manager for ABB Robotics Canada. For those who recognize the name ABB, this company was the first to produce robotics uh, in 1974 and today has a global installed base of over 600,000 units. Next, Ben Hugenboss, president of Boss Innovation, an automation integrator located in Dorchester, Ontario, soon to open a brand new facility in the Innovation Park in London, Ontario. I'm Shelley Fellows, chair of the board of directors for Automate Canada. We'll hear from both Nicholas and Ben this morning, then we'll open up our panel to questions from our audience. Please use the Q&A tab for your questions. We will be addressing them following Ben and Nicholas's presentations. So first, Nicholas, um, he brings a depth of experience within the field of robotics uh, and within ABB itself to our discussion today. He's worked within R&D, applications, customer service, and general management within ABB and relocated to Canada almost five years ago to join ABB Robotics Canada. Uh, ben is a second generation owner of Boss Innovation. You could say a passion for automation runs in his blood. Boss is an automation integrator working with the latest technologies from robotics, machine vision and industrial lasers along with advanced tooling and controls. Their customer base includes automotive manufacturers and companies within the energy and resource sectors. Let's start this morning with the ABB perspective. Nicholas? Thank you, Shelley. Let me see if I can uh, <clears throat> just get my screen up um, and share it. Can, so, Shelley, can you just confirm that the screen is showing okay? Absolutely. It looks good, Nicholas. Perfect. Thank you, Shelley. So, uh, first, thanks, uh, Shelley, for that introduction. Uh, and also, thanks in, in, in uh, Invest Windsor Essex and Automate Canada for having ABB presented this breakout session. It's, uh, it, we're very honored to, to be part of this and looking forward to the discussion. Uh, also a pleasure to be here with Boss Innovation and Ben Hugenboss uh, representing Boss uh, as a very competent and, and the capable integrator in the uh, industrial robot and automation uh, industry. So my, uh, I will show a couple of slides um, uh, for today. And, and I will I will focus uh, more on the potential and, and I would say the enormous potential for robot automation. Uh, I decided to to choose the title here to enabling robot automation uh, because I think there is a lot of the technologies uh, is already is already established and we already have it available. But it's more about how do we enable robot automation uh, in into the different businesses. Uh, there was once someone told me that an innovation is uh, the combination of two known things. And I think that is pretty much where we are right now. We have a lot of things available. We just need to combine them in, in order to, to uh, utilize that technology and to do innovation and enabling robot automation. So with that, uh, let me see. I will just go over here. And sorry, just flip the slide here. So I just have a, a, a few slides to show, uh, and this will be the outline. So first, take a look a little bit about uh, on the market outlook and the market potential. Uh, it will be a little bit uh, kind of touching the same points that, that Christy from Engine was showing in, in the previous speak. Uh, but um, I, I would maybe like to give it a little bit of a different perspective to it. Then look at the trends and pain points. Uh, what we from uh, from ABB, what we see in the market, and also some of the some of the studies and surveys that we have done, and and see uh, and share that result as well. And then at the end, look at some enabling uh, technologies. So just going into the market potential. Uh, so 
Uh, Christy mentioned that uh, Canada is uh, is a country of a lot of small medium enterprise companies, and and that is something that we definitely share. When we look at the statistics, uh, we see that every year it's about more than uh, more than half if is still from the from the automotive industry, but there is a, uh, a very big market outside the automotive industry. And depending on the year, we estimate that 35 to 50 percent of the business is actually outside the automotive industry. And when we say automotive, we we include the, the OEMs and also the major tier one suppliers to to uh, to that industry. Uh, saying that, uh, we're also looking at. Uh, uh, so, so I will kind of. We, we also kind of separate uh, automotive from the non-automotive or the general industry, as, as we call it, uh, because they have a little bit of different dynamics. The automotive industry is very advanced, uh, while the general industry is, is less automated and, and also have other challenges than the, the automotive. So, so maybe we'll focus a little bit more uh, outside the automotive in this, uh, in this presentation. So looking just at Canada, um, and some of the statistics that we get out of that, uh, we know that labor shortage or finding skilled labor is one of the main challenging uh, for for a number of companies, and and that has been maybe even harder now during the last uh, 18 months when we've had when we've had COVID, and and uh, and we see that six out of 10 companies do have a hard time to find uh, find the right labor and the right uh, skilled labor. Uh, and, and that is not only impacting what they can do, but it also limiting their growth potential, um, which I will come back to later on. But I think that's a very important important factor when we look at uh, at automation. It's not only about the business case and, and the return on investment today. It's about limiting the growth uh, if you cannot uh, if you cannot uh, meet the demand that is out there. Uh, also looking to our uh, southern neighbors. Um, we know that there's a lot of companies and a lot of integrators in uh, in Canada is of course tightly related to the U.S. market. Uh, and and even though U.S. Uh, like Chris has said was uh, is having a stronger or or larger um, of the of the bigger companies, um, it's still 75 percent of the manufacturing companies have less than than, than 20 employees and and. Four out of ten manufacturing workers are in the SME, so it's it's a huge market uh, that is outside outside the automotive and the, and the big industries. Uh, and a lot of people and a lot of partners that we discuss, they are very focused on on either automotive or maybe the Fortune 500. But there is a lot of industry uh, uh, besides that that is uh, that, that is there to to grab. Um, also wanted to go in a little bit on the market statistics. It's uh, it will show um, a little bit what what Chris also was showing. Uh, we follow the robot density uh, uh, very closely, and and for ABB, I mean we follow it globally to see uh, how the different markets are developing. And the robot density is is measured as the number of robots employed by 10,000 manufacturing workers. Uh, and, and that is that data that is coming from the Inter International Federation of Robotics. Uh, so, of course, there might be some uncertainties in there, but I think it's it's uh, uh, good enough uh, to give it a guideline. And I just picked a couple of countries here, um, and um, and what you see there to the the light gray, the left bar, the leftmost bar for each country is the robot density, the robot density for the country. Uh, where the red one is the non-automotive and the dark gray is the automotive. And as we see, automotive industry is very well established and is very well automated across the globe, and it is very a global market. There is some geographic, geographical um, variations, uh, but it is a lot of global companies that is driving this uh, across the globe, and what they do in one country, they replicate to another country as well. So that's it's fairly hom homogeneous across across the world um, the red one is uh, is more interesting uh, from an from from that standpoint and what is i think is what chris mentioned and, and what i was also concerned about is where canada sits on this um, where where we have in this case a, a number of 71 and compared to other companies or other countries we see that that is half of the adaptation level of us for example 
Uh, and it's even even when we compare to low, uh, what we in the past have considered low cost countries like China, it's uh, we're even behind China in, in that sense. Uh, and if you also look at the adaptation rate, and now we looked at the adaptation rate only in the non-automotive business, uh, then I think it's even more concerning. Um, again, looking at, uh, at uh, the US and our, our southern neighbor, they have they are ahead of ahead of Canada, and they also have a faster growing rate of of adapting um, robot automation. And also, I mean, we we do think that uh, there's a lot of labor in low cost countries. But looking at China in the non automotive segment, it's it's just exploding when it comes to robot automation. And currently, China is the main driver of robot automation uh, around around the globe. Uh, so I think that stigma or that uh, uh, um, what we said in the past that that you know in low cost countries they use use labor I think that is uh, something that we we cannot really say anymore and and uh, for for a country or for companies to be competitive we really need to to get on this train. Also, when I look at the few mega trends or or. And, and pain points. I will not go through all of this. Uh, I will just touch base on a couple of ones. Uh, I would start from from the trends and sustainability, uh, and and how that um, how that impacts uh, also the automation uh, automation industry. Uh, I mean, sustainability is, uh, as we all know, something that everyone is discussing. Uh, but we also see that that is now driving and creating demand uh, uh, for changing the way uh, manufacturing and, uh, and production is done. Um, one, one area is, for example, we see this uh, very fast transition into some kind of EV or hybrid or hydrogen, uh, not only for the automotive, but we also see it for recreational vehicles, we see it for two wheelers, we see it for transportation. Uh, vehicles, etc. It's pretty much going going uh, across anything that has to do with, with transportation, uh, which of course then changes uh, changes the manufacturing and and production of of those components. Uh, I also would like to mention another another area, and and uh, that is the construction business. Uh, and again, again from sustainability. Uh, uh, in measurements, it's been seen that about uh, a quarter or 25 percent of the material to a construction site ends up as waste, and that is, of course, from a sustainability point of view, it, it's it's a, a huge amount. But then also from a financial standpoint, it, it's also there's a lot of cost going uh, going with that waste. Uh, uncertainty, we touched upon it, uh, and I think Ben will touch upon it even even further. I will not mention too much, but I mean, especially now we're seeing with COVID, we have uncertainty in supply chain, whether that is logistics or if it's a ship shortage. Uh, we have uncertainties is in different trade negotiations and, and, and trade barriers that is coming and going. Uh, so it, it's it's a lot of uh, the conditions for our business are changing in a very rapid pace, and it's sometimes very hard to predict. So it's it's uh, it's it's driving the behavior. Uh, what what we need to do. The last one I would like to mention is is flexibility. We do see that uh, uh, what was in the past, where it was uh, uh, high volume, low mix, is as as we all now going to. To low volume, high mix, uh, and that is not o not only for um, consumer products where everyone would like to have in the, uh, individual um, individual products, but we also see it in the automotive industry now. With where you have to produce a combustion engine, you have to produce an EV, you have to produce a hybrid, you have to produce a hydrogen, and when you combine all of this, the, the volume for each become less, and you need to have a more flexible. Uh, manufacturing that that was not the, the reality uh, or the demand in the past. So that's some of the trends. Looking at the, uh, at the at the pain points, um, of course, we're coming back to the uncertainty. Uh, and again, I think Ben will touch upon it. Um, with all those uncertainties, 
um, and all the changes, the rapid changes that cause a lot of pain uh, for, for the manufacturers in order to manage uh, all, all the changes. Uh, I would also bring up uh, uh, the, the competitiveness uh, and also tying it back to the statistics uh, b before. Um, it's not really it, it's not really the way forward to add people uh, in terms of uh, doing the actual physical labor work. There is much more high value uh, tasks that, uh, that that the humans are more intended for, and and uh, in order to be competitive, it needs to be an an automated and, and very flexible um, automation. Uh, the last one uh, I will touch upon is, is of course, uh, productivity um, and, uh, and the lack of, of skilled labor. Uh, in or, and as mentioned before, that is kind of limiting what, what can be done and, and also uh, limit the growth of, of uh, the different customers. I also so that was the trend and pain points, um, and and sometimes we're also very focused on uh, what is stopping us from uh, from, from uh, enabling uh, robot automation. But I also wanted to touch upon what actually is the actual benefits of uh, of implementing um, robot and, and robot automation. So what we have done, uh, and this is this is about a year old study. Uh, it's more than 1,600 of our customers that we've had uh, deep interviews with uh, and asking them after uh, they had implemented robots and robot automation, what was the actual benefits? So in, in many cases, we, 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 uh, in, in our sales pitch, of course, we, we say a lot of things that this is going to be the benefits, but this is the actual benefits after the product has been, been implemented. So of course, um, um, on first place is, is reduced operating cost when it comes to, to um, and, and that is probably the most common what we see um, um, as the main contributor to return on investment decision. Um, but so so that's of course very important. Uh, it gives you a, uh, an edge. It gives you competitiveness. It gives you a better bottom line. It also free up, uh, free up funding for, for reinvesting and, and become an even more successful uh, manufacturer in, in the future. Uh, but then there's a few others that I want to wanna touch upon. Uh, almost at the same level, we see improved product quality and consistency. Uh, and in my world, that translates to customer satisfaction, meaning that we are able to uh, deliver high quality products. Um, and, and of course, it's also with product quality, it, it's come um, with less waste. So it's also gonna end up at the, at the bottom line at the, at the end. Uh, but I think the most important is the customer satisfaction um, getting, uh, getting out of that. Uh, then we have um, increased production up output that I would say is also a very common, uh, common criteria or parameter when we're looking at the return on investments. Uh, and and uh, the last one I would like to touch upon is uh, more related to uh, employee satisfaction. So we have improved workplace health and safety. Um, we have reduced staff turnover. We have improved quality of work and job satisfaction for employees. And all of those um, different aspects, they kind of tie back to uh, employee satisfaction. And um, keeping in mind that where six out of 10 have a hard time to find the skilled labor. Uh, so in order to um, make your life and, and your, your employees more satisfied and, and in that reduce your staff turnover is, is extremely important in order to continue to, to grow the, the company. And so we think this is a very important, uh, some of them are what we all know uh, like the again the operating cost and, and so on, but I would I would definitely uh, emphasize on the product quality and consistency and also the employee satisfaction and reduce turnover as benefits of robot and, and robot automation. Um, I will skip this one. I see the time is running a little bit, so I will just touch on. Uh, uh, 
key enabling technologies as we see it. Um, we think that flexibility, of course, and in our case, we, we make uh, that the same as, uh, as modularity. And, and what you see there in, the, in this uh, animation going is a machine tending or parts feeding uh, system where you see everything is built up from modules. You can have parts feeded from, uh, from conveyors. It could be a tray, it could be pallets. Uh, you can have different uh, different robot configuration if it's uh, floor mounted or if it's on top. You can have fencing. Um, you can have uh, pallets and, and a number of different uh, configurations to it. But it all build on the same platform and it's all different modules. That also enables another uh, another aspect that if you have uh, decided to invest in one of those. Um, and then after a year or two, you have to retool it. You can still keep a lot of um, a lot of your in initial uh, investment and just retool. If you now okay, now I have to change from a from a pallet to a conveyor. Right? Then you you change that module, and the rest will will remain the same. Simplicity uh, and ease of use is another uh, another aspect that we think is extremely important, and we we do have very powerful. Uh, simulation tools uh, uh, that is available in the market. And in our case, we call it Robot Studio. Uh, but also in the solution that we see here in, in the in the simulation or animation, everything is you see now when it's turning, you see the the, the HMI. It's a very ease of use and intuitive HMI. Uh, encapsulates all the programming, so you don't have to know anything about programming. You just teach. If you have to change the part, you just teach it from a graphical use interface uh, and, and off you go and, and you do the next one. So there's no need for having you know, expert knowledge in, in role of programming. Last one is digitalization and connectivity. Um, and, and that is very much related then to, uh, for, first of all, to make it ease of use and be able, like I said, to teach and train new, new, uh, new, uh, new products. But it's also to optimize the output of, of your uh, of your installation. So getting getting warnings if something is not working, uh, getting um, proposals or, or main KPIs that you can so you can uh, optimize your your production. Uh, and also when it comes to to monitoring, uh, we usually. Uh, speak about uh, monitoring the big events. Oh, now, now something is broken. We need to fix it uh, and we need to get up and running as fast as possible. But also, there's another aspect uh, of, of micro stops. You might have a few things that's happening, but, uh, and it only takes 10 seconds to get it up and running again. But if that is happening uh, a number of times during a day and you sum it up, that, uh, that ends up in, in a lot of disturbances for your production. So uh, I see time is flying. So with that, I would uh, I would stop and I would hand over to Ben to give uh, the the perspective from uh, the, the integrators. Okay, thank you, Nicholas. It was great. Um, just give me one second, and I will get my uh, presentation up and running here. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Ben Hugenboss. So I'm the president of uh, Boss Innovations, as Shelley mentioned. Um, I guess if you're if you're joining us in this breakout room, then you're very curious to know where robotic technology is heading in the years ahead. So whether you're a manufacturer or an integrator like me, this this topic and where it's going in the future can be very stressful for businesses. You know, we're busy producing, we're busy with operational issues, and it can be very difficult to predict the future um, and assimilate all that complex information about technologies. It can be uh, very difficult and expensive uh, to build and align expertise within your organization. So it's also a very exciting topic. We get to innovate and we get to create and we get to create niches for our organizations and, and strategic advantages. So that's some of the exciting stuff about it. Um, so I hope you can enjoy the perspectives of boss innovations when it comes to some of the emerging technologies in the automation industry and how you might apply them. Uh, this isn't a comprehensive analysis in, by any stretch of the imagination, but it, it is just some of the new tech getting our attention. Uh, 
I'm going to have a bit of a focus on some of the um, uh, some of the vision technologies because that's uh, that there's a lot of exciting things happening there. There are exciting things happening in other areas. I'm very happy to talk to any of you about it uh, after uh, you know Boss is doing uh, technology on the uh, you know laser and robotic laser uh, side of things, uh, for example, um, and and as well as on the collaborative robot and different types of things there. I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, and also some of the data and uh, you know predictive maintenance technologies that are starting to come to market. We are we're investing and paying a lot of attention in those areas too. But I won't get into that a whole lot. Um, so uh, let's just start with why advancement in automation is needed. So uh, what is this? And and Nicholas talked a lot about this. I won't spend a lot of time on it. But what are what is the necessity? You know the necessity is the mother of all inventions. So what is the necessity that's driving some of what I'm going to show you today? So there's, as Nicholas said, there's major workforce pressures. There's major uh, supply chain uh, pressures. Um, you know, with with workforce, we're talking about um, uh, you know changing preferences in the in the workforce for what they want to do for a living. There's accelerating retirement. There, you know, demographic challenges are, are big, and and even the quality. To be honest, the quality of the average labor isn't the same as what it once was. So, you know, on the onshoring side. Uh, you know, is is accelerating. There's uh, it's due to supply chain problems is one of it that's been making it really accelerate. Um, and national and corporate security as reasons. Uh, that's just a, I guess, metaphorical burning ship that we saw yesterday. Uh, maybe it's too soon, but you know, it is a big problem. There's ships waiting offshore. Um, uh, and then there's the, I guess, the um, the competitive necessity for businesses. And Nicholas talked a lot about this, about what it, what the benefits are. To companies, and and I really appreciated that information. You know, it we have to be efficient and adaptable and flexible in our production environments. The the products that are being asked to produce today are of a higher quality requirement, different materials. Uh, you know, very difficult to work with, and they require also a higher capability uh, all around uh, to be able to do that. So, and and much more flexibility. We we know we need that in our production environments. So, and I guess we inherently know as integrators and manufacturers that we cannot be left behind that is that is something that we know we can't have so how do we navigate this you know and and one of the things why automation advancement is happening as well and we can't ignore it, it's because we can there's been huge technological leaps and and uh, in 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 uh and collaborations that have made this possible so with a focus on that let's uh let's move ahead so some of the barriers that are being knocked down are robotics safety uh of the hardware and solution complexity, you know, it was inflexible uh, in working among operators fluidly. So these are things that are being knocked down. It, it used to be a very hardware-based solution. Now it's becoming very much sensor and software. Uh, speed and ease of deployment for complex production. So high mix, low volume that Nicholas talked about cannot be reasonably programmed maintained. Those walls are being knocked down through, uh, and we'll get into that. Nicholas showed you some of what they're doing. Uh, the human level uh, vision and dexterity to interact with the processes as a person would quickly, reliably, and accurately. Those are getting knocked down, and they have to. They have to because of what uh, what uh, manufacturing is doing today. Some of the breakthroughs, so AI and machine learning. Um, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about that in the vision side of things. Uh, hardware innovations and image processing, the ability to process a lot of data faster, better, and present it back. Advanced sec sensor technology and edge processing. This is helping with the hardware innovations. You know, being able to filter the data as it's being detected and then not have so much data on the network, not have so much processing power required. And then industry collaboration and integration of technology. Um, so there, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end, but just the way the industry is working together, working in modules like Nicholas was talking about there, you know, uh, using uh, open source and different uh, starting points like that and working together and in a, knowing that their technology can integrate with all the various robot manufacturers, for example, and come to an integrator like us at times and, and we can make all of this stuff fit together for whatever the solution is that we're trying to do. That's really critical uh, to and what is allowing some of what's happening today. Okay, so uh, machine learning and AI performing human level uh, vision tasks. So it's impossible to to really talk about emerging technologies and robotics without discussing this. Um, so by using 3D vision and AI, robots are being you know empowered to respond to to parts in near real time. 
So, which means that the part mix is finally no longer a limiter for some of the worst bottlenecks in the industry in manufacturing. So, we present. Uh, I'm going to present about three plus a few uh, other uh, things on the fringe, but three new technological advance advances that are contributing to this breakthrough that I think are really interesting and maybe new to some of you at least. So there's a, and, and I'll present three companies. There's way more than that out there, but there's three interesting companies that, that we've learned a little bit about um, and, and have talked to. And one is Prophecy, uh, is, is event-based sensing. And so what this is, this is at the sensor. This is some of that edge processing that I'm talking about. You know, each pixel in the sensor detects intelligently when there is a change in the scene and activates accordingly. So it, it basically, it does not flood the network with, um, with useless data, it only tells the system, the sensor only tells the system, the, the network and the processors and, and whatever's, whatever it's uh, sending its information to, if there's a change. So on the, what does that mean? Well, on the right, you can see what that means. Um, a traditional frame-based uh, vision system, and whether that's, uh, whether that's a, a visual or some sort, sort of LIDAR or anything like that, you'll get snapshots like this, okay? Um, if you're if you're using an event base, you can get something that that really gives you very much a time and speed. You can do vectors. You can see exactly where the system is at any any point, and, and very rapidly detect changes in motion of robots. And that has a lot of different benefits, where you can you can more quickly react to changes, whether it be for safety, whether you know if you're tracking material on a conveyor that you're trying to deal with robotically, you can very quickly adapt to changes that 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 you detect. Um, so that's a very interesting type of technology that's new on the market that's, a, that's opening up a number of different avenues of applications uh, uh, in the industry. None of these things on their own are anything, it's how they integrate together that brings some of the solutions that are coming. This is AI laser dot triangulation. And you can see what this allows is if there's, uh, you basically use AI to, if you if you have a blurred image, if you have images that are in low light or that um, that are that are maybe not easy to see, and some of the pixels don't come through, you can use kind of the the whole map of pixels to know where your objects are. Still, you don't need all the pixels to get a clear picture. And the effect of that is what you can see is you get a very crisp and clear and and quickly captured picture, like you see in the bottom left versus what you might get in a more blurred and less and less uh, stable picture as you see in, in some of the time of flight sensors and traditional 3D uh, stereo vision in the bottom. So this is this may seem insignificant, but it allows for high accuracy, high speed, and, um, and less failures in processing. You get very uh, stable uh, image capture. So these are some of the things that are being used in robotics. Um, and this is uh, from a company called Real-Time Robotics, a very, very interesting thing that they're doing. So basically, they're allowing the development of motion planning uh, in real time. So they, they basically have vision systems. Some of the vision systems that, we, uh, that I just showed you can be used for this um, and integrated into the, this, uh, this way of processing. And these guys are more on the processing and software side where they can have a robot that's moving and let's say a human comes into the cell, they can actually slow down, move around it. Or if there's another object, like another robot, they can detect it and change its path to go around that object and uh, create its own motion planning to go around it. So this can be, you know, very interesting uh, for flexible environments where you're, you're, you're maybe, you have a lot of things in motion. Perhaps you even have humans involved in the situation. Um, they are getting, uh, there are applications of this that are now in the fail safe uh, uh, realm of things that can be used for, for safety applications as well. So this is, this is a very interesting technology that has uh, a lot of potential um, in flexible automation and being able to do that high mix, low volume and and work in in less stable fixtured environments so uh it can it can detect your work surface and your work picture and i'll show you that in a little bit it can detect where your parts are if they're if they're not uh fixtured identically every time it's okay uh, and and really help you to uh to uh to apply uh that sort of technology so Moving on, uh, this is an interesting technology from a company called Reveal Robotics. Um, and what this is, is they basically use um, these free move sensors, which uh, are a time of flight type sensor, and they'll, they'll put them around a work cell. And their system is, is uh, 
is now on the market. And, it, and one of the things is it works with all, all pretty much all the major mo robot manufacturers. It, it integrates very tightly into their firmware and can actually uh, provide data, as you see in the middle picture, of what's happening in the work cell and monitor for humans coming into the work cell. Um, the application you're seeing on the left is that robot is, is presenting uh, basically uh, uh, something to the operator for them to work on that the operator can't handle. It's maybe too heavy or whatever it is. And it's within a collaborative workspace with a, with a, with a general robot, with any robot that isn't collaborative. So you can get the full weight, full speed of a typical robot, yet allow humans to, to interact with it very closely um, and, uh, and adapt on the fly to any human intrusion, slow down, stop. If the human's not is in the work cell, but not within the range of, of, the, uh, of the robot, it will still allow it to continue to work. So, and it very intuitively stops and, and restarts and can continue. So it's a, it's a very intuitive and, and beautiful way of, uh, of creating a, a very, uh, uh, I guess, uh, seamless safety system where you would have not been able to do that in the past. And if you did, it would have been with extensive amounts of safety, hardware, programming, planning, risk analysis, and well, costs. Um, some here's an application of a scan to pass. So just some of the things that, that are being applied. Uh, so on the, on the left is a, is a scan to path type of setup using the real time robotics and, and some sensors from the market that basically allow, uh, you know, you to set up a cell in this case, I believe it's a welding cell that they're, that they've demonstrated here that you can have very simple fixturing and have a whole library of different uh, parts that need to be welded and then the system will recognize what you've put into it and it will find the paths that you've specified in the library and then it will adapt and, and do the, the types of weld that uh, that you've pre-programmed for that. So uh, you could have a, a library of, of 100 different parts or more um, that that the system will just automatically recognize and, and, and find it and reorientate itself, plan its path and make the, make the welding happening. That's one particular uh, application that they've actually released. We've got uh, an application here that, that we've done in the automotive industry and, and we're actually where we're, we're moving along with uh, vehicles and one of our newest technologies is we're using vision to actually track the vehicle so we do not have to link to it anymore and we can respond instantly to changes in motion of that, uh, of that you know, uh, work piece in motion. So that's, uh, that's some ways that we're using some of the latest technology and applying it. Um, and in the in the AI and machine learning um, point of view, and, and I know I'll have to wrap up very quickly, just machine learning, you can do all sorts of uh, human level inspection without the human factor is what we like to say. Basically, if a human can see it, we can see it. You know, you don't need perfect lighting. You don't need uh, consistent lighting necessarily for, for every little thing. You, you, need to, you need to be able to see it and, and then allow the system to learn uh, much the way a human does. Um, this is happening now. We are using this technology in active and we are putting this technology at times on, on robots and doing end of line inspection uh, to, to do, use the robot to move around the workpiece. And, and, you know, the case on the left, it's, a, it's, it's just checking for all the, that everything's uh, installed on the, on the right is more of a demonstration of, of doing a weld quality using machine learning. We can actually look at welds and look for presence and quality of welds um, on that. So, uh, just quickly, AGVs uh, and mobile robots. So this is something that's very uh, prevalent in the warehousing industry. Some of the changes that you're uh, that you're seeing is continued uh, ad advancement in the natural feature navigation for for AGVs that just uses whatever's in the plant as its as its uh, basis for where it's going to go and doing its own path planning. There's a company like ClearPath Robotics that does its own path planning through a plant. You give it some rules on a map, but other than that, it, it takes care of uh, uh, where it can go and finds its way to its destination. Um, this is all being driven by advances in software, advances in sensor technology, and uh, and that sort of thing. We're also seeing, and uh, you know, the use of robotics on top of uh, AGVs. Uh, so. In, in this case, you know, um, you know, flexible machine tending or or any type of different applications. We're seeing even a lab environment here on the on the left, for example. These are these are all possible now with the technology that's out there, including the battery technology, the the, the computer hardware, everything that goes with it, sensor technology, and ease of programming. Um, 
one of the one of the great things. This is this is something we've developed, and and we've we had a special application that there just wasn't an AGV on the market for, and we were able to use the technology from the market and fairly quickly develop our own system using uh, systems that were available on the market. So this is uh, a little bit about that. Um, and uh, love to talk to you more about that, but uh, but I'm just giving you a quick flyover. So what is happening to affect this change? Well, organizations like ROS, Robot Operating System, is what that stands for, ROS, uh, with common open source uh, middleware, where industry and startups collaborate using common intellectual knowledge and building blocks that are that are helping drive collaboration. So making sensors and software that all works together around a common uh, platform and open source uh, way of, of communicating. Uh, companies like ABB and what Nicholas showed you, they're making kits and modules that integrators like us can more easily and quickly integrate with lower risk and cost to the end user. Uh, simulation and emulation tools to improve viability and, and time to integrate, lowering risk for everybody. Uh, universities are, are, and schools and colleges are training youth um, in, in integration and mechatronics. We're, we're seeing youth come out that just already inherently knows this. Organizations like First Robotics, that sort of thing. Very, very solid talent in that area, as much as they're still in demand. Um, and then grants from agencies like IRAP, NGEN, SHED, the SRNED programs in Ontario. These are these are available to help manufacturers and integrators like us to actually um, develop some of these technologies like we used for our AGV technology. Um, challenges still ahead. Well, expertise and specialization is just getting is getting more deep and all that's uh, and, and more difficult. Uh, that's a challenge to the workforce in the high tech sector. Collaboration between companies is challenging commercially. Um, and then risk and uncertain limitations in tech. High investment to determine what is possible on a practical level with technology that is still in the development phases. And then, li honestly, limited end user risk tolerance in R&D funding. They, they're, they're, there's outdated payback models. Uh, you know, Nicholas's slide really talked about some of the intangible benefits uh, for quality, health and safety, customer satisfaction, employee turnover costs, these sorts of things that really need to get into the conversation when it comes to um, payback models at, at the factory floor because uh, they are real and they are only going to grow. So uh, just a couple of other little plugs for some of the stuff we're doing on the data side, just, you know, our connectivity to various machines that we can expand this into the data. Uh, some of the laser stuff, we too are developing, you know, some modules that we can pick from as we, as we, um, as we develop uh, systems. So thank you. I will pass it back over to Shelly. I appreciate your attention. I hope I didn't go too far over time. I tried to run through it quickly, but um, <laughs> hopefully not too quickly. Sorry if it was. So my, aren't we so fortunate to have so much material to talk about when we're talking about, you know, your focus, Ben, you were looking at applications for robotics in, in manufacturing in different sectors. Nicholas was looking at it a, from a bit of a higher level perspective. Um, to go with the agenda, 10.35, we're back at the main stage. It's 10.35 right now. So on behalf of the group, I want to say thank you so very much to Nicholas Sustron from ABB Robotics Canada, Ben Hugenboss from Boss Innovations, a proud Ontario company. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.